sort of put together some technical winter videos on typical things that you'd be doing during the uh, off season so I had time here in Cartagena there was quite a lot of bits and pieces in the end so I've actually split it up because you would have lost the will to live before you got halfway through if I had it all together so you can just try and pick out the bits that you want there's one uh, on varnishing uh, there's one on bilge pumps, we had a problem with one of the bilge pumps and I've gone through all the, the bilge pumps uh, on, on this boat. Uh, there's one on checking things uh, up the mast as well, it's quite an important one, as well as ones that we've already put out. There's one on uh, oil change and there's one on stripping down the Lumar winches on the boat, so you can look out for those. Uh, so for this one it's just the bits that are left and we're going to start with a problem we had way back in Portugal where we couldn't wind in the Yankee and I had to actually jury rig uh, that for the rest of the trip and that lasted all the way until we came back from Ibiza when again we had some strong winds and uh, the jury rig slipped and we're getting a riding turn. So now that needs to be mended properly, it needs some welding and uh, needs to be taken off. So first step, get the Yankee down and packed away and I've got to slacken off the back stay to make it easier to, to get the fore stay off. We've got this stainless steel construction that holds the radar so I can uh, try and hold that up out the way of the bottle screw, get the split pins out and loosen off the bottle screw. Uh, we try and uh, count the turns but I've got some tape on the bottom so I can try and get it back in the, in the same spot. Then of course we've got to support the mast forward. I've got two halyards that go to the top of the mast, the, uh, the Yankee and the Spinnaker. So I've got both of those in uh, and they go as you see right to the top of the mast there. We can tighten those up and make sure that they're taking some load and pulling the mast forward. Then just as belt and braces, I know it's not really necessary, we have a removable stay that we have our storm sail on that uh, I can put through with this high fill lever, I can tighten it up. This is the bit that we need welded. So to get this off, I need to slide the drum up to get to the, uh, the bottle screw here and uh, true to form, you've got uh, stainless steel going into aluminium and two of the bolts have broken off. So a bit of drilling needed, I'm going to have to drill them out a bit bigger and tap the holes when I put it all back on. So now we can uh, get round to lifting this drum up and undoing the bottle screw at the bottom here to, to slacken it off so we can get the uh, cotter pin out. And try and give this a good clean, it's not really turning that well, I'm marking it the same as the, the back there so I know where to put it back to. But actually the bottom swivel was seized, uh, but you can see got quite a bit of slack here just from slacking off the uh, the backstay so I'm having a go at just taking it out as it is and then unseizing once I've got it off. Problem with this of course is when you try and bash out a cotter pin it's bound to go in the water along with everything else so tie things on and uh, and then get around to trying to pull it out any way you can. It did get there eventually and amazingly nothing went in the water. So let's have a look at these holes. It's obviously uh, happened before and some people have drilled new holes and uh, I'm just going to have to widen up the ones I've got here and tap them out to take a, a bigger screw. I'll put a bit of dielectric grease on them. It's, it's just this dissimilar metals thing that gets things seized up in there uh, quite often and it is a sort of a, a toss up whether to put the, the dielectric grease on or to put some Loctite on because you don't want these things coming out. But but you can put some tape around the outside, which is what I do. These things are notorious for coming loose. The aluminium's soft and the, and the foil just jiggles around a lot and they just work their way out. So while the drum's off for welding, it's on to the next job, which is decks. And when we bought Fair Isle, uh, the decks weren't treated at all. They were just left grey. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I do prefer to put something on, partly because I think it looks better, but mainly because I think it protects the wood and stops it getting so dirty, which means you're going to clean it less and not wear it away as quickly. You can see from these pictures the sort of stains and the dirt that was in the teak. We also had quite a bit of mould was on fresh water, so that encourages this green, horrible, slimy stuff. And the best thing to get that off is boracol, which isn't acidic at all. It's just a fungicide and uh, it takes it off completely. Once that's done, I put on Semco, which I really like. This is actually in April last year in the UK. You need a couple of dry days. This was the end of April. It's probably the first opportunity in the, in the UK to do it. It's a water-based product and you just put it on quite easily and quickly with a, a rag. 
And the, the beauty of it is is that it has a UV protector to protect the, the wood from sunlight. But I think the main thing is that it does stop the stains and anything getting into it, any of that dirt getting into the wood, which means you're going to clean it less, which means you're going to wear it away less and, and not produce those ridges and have to sand it down and gradually wear away your teak, which is what, what happens. It is something that you'll have to do every year. It gradually wears away, and that's why I'm showing you this from a year ago to show you what it sort of looks like now. But also, uh, we can show you this to see what uh, what difference it makes. If we look at this board, this is a bit of wood that's on the boat, board that's sort of stored here up against the box that I rubbed down at the same time as uh, all the other woodwork on the boat. I mean, admittedly, that was three years ago, but you can see the difference. I and mean, it looked like that really within a year. It went a bit dark and, and just dirty looking, and it hasn't had any use. It's just been stored there. So, yeah, I think the Semco does do a good job at protecting things. Things have been pretty good, Nick, this year. You can see there's a few little uh, mould spots here which are clean off easily. And I've got some wear marks on things like the pin rail. That's my fault, really. I put two coats on instead of one, and I was using a slightly darker colour that time. Uh, but the test that you do do to see if it needs it is just to drip some water on and see if it beads up. Uh, this isn't beading up, it's soaking in, so it's time for another coat. So first thing, good wash. I just use a little bit of uh, washing up liquid, doesn't need anything stronger than that. Let it dry and then we can put another coat on. So the colour I like most is natural. I have used honey before, that was that darker colour, I think it looked a bit plasticky. You can mix colours together if you want a specific colour. main thing to, to know though with Semco is that it needs a good mix up before you start to use it. All the, the colour, the sediment sort of goes to the bottom, so mix it well beforehand and as you're using it they provide you with a stick to encourage you to do that. I decant it into a, um, a little plastic container and stir it as you go. And as you can see it's pretty easy to put on. If you're putting it on correctly, it stretches quite a long way. I find a tin will do everything on Fair Isle. And don't forget, we've got the decks and the boxes and the top sides around the outside of the gunnels as well. So there's a, a big area to do. So this is why I had problems getting the forestay off this uh, bottle screw at the bottom here. Uh, it's supposed to swivel in there after you've taken this screw out, but it was, it was just seized up. Um, and wouldn't really turn very well so couldn't get enough slack in that so it's a good job that I slackened the, the backstay off gave me enough uh, um, room to, to be able to, to get it out just about. Uh, I'm going to have to clean that up obviously before I'll put that back on. Have a look at all the other moving parts as well. So the swivel here it is turning but it's not great so I'll get the circlip off that have a look at what's inside there and clear it all up. Quite often these days uh, you have these polyoxyethylene balls inside. Uh, Delrin is the usual one that's used, that's the DuPont version of it. Um, so they're, they're plastic and you should just wash them through with uh, water, just clean clean water, get the salt out of them uh, and not put anything on them at all. Um, you can, um, there's, there's certain things you can dress them with but really you're not supposed to put anything on, on at all. Uh, but this one I've just found, uh, the bottom swivel here, you can see through it and um, and there are ball bearings in there so it is metal so that needs oiling so I'll wash that through with a load of WD-40 and probably put a light oil in it the sort of stuff I use on the winch poles will, will be fine for that and uh, yeah I'll have to make sure that I lubricate them. There are lots of different uh, lubricants around I might do a, a piece on those one day because they, you know, they've got the PTFE, the silicones, the different oil type sprays as well and what to use them on can get a bit confusing uh, I've got a few favourite ones I use so I might do a little item on that at some point. What was that I said? I'd just take the circlip off and have a look. The circlip's off, but it's not coming apart. So yes, it really has been two days uh, trying to get this thing apart using heat and banging it and plus gas and leaving it overnight and then trying again. Must have been about five times heating it up and bashing it and then finally it, uh, it did come apart and we've got a million different uh, ball bearings now to go back in and you can see it's a bit marked in there, it needs polishing out and uh, I don't know how I'm going to do that, maybe just with some wet and dry, maybe the Dremel or something, I'll have a go, try and smooth all that out again and uh, get it back together. It was just made too tight really, it must have been pushed on with a press and couldn't really get it off. 
I think at some point in the future I'll be looking for a machine shop to take uh, something off this and maybe put some larger ball bearings in. But for now we're just uh, going to do the best we can, uh, smooth stuff out and uh, hopefully get it running a bit smoother. I'm using some winch grease to lubricate the whole unit. It's quite nice and sticky as well so it can hold the, uh, the ball bearings in place while you carefully put it all together. It is important that furlers run easily. You do want to be able to furl them up quickly by hand without too much winching. So it is important, I think, to get a, the friction down as much as you can. And now that I can get the top on just with a little tap, I'll be able to take the circlip off and remove this and grease it up whenever I need. The drum's not back from the world as yet, so I'm going to spend some time cleaning out the sow locker. The chain gets a fresh water wash and you make sure that the limber holes are clear so the water drains away. You don't want the chain sitting in water. It's amazing how much gear you can fit in a sow locker. And this is without the two fold up bikes that we put in here while we're sailing. You can climb in through the deck hatch into the sow locker, but that's not the only opening. We do have this hatch that opens up to the foyer cabin so we can get uh, into the, to the locker from there. I don't find that, that useful to be honest. I'd rather uh, have this as a, as a crash bulkhead and have it sealed all the way down. You'd have to have something at bilge level that opened up because the chain locker does drain through the bilges and it goes all the way through and then pumps it out. Um, but yeah, on the whole, I think it might be something that we do in future, make this a, a crash bulkhead. While I'm organising things, it's a good chance to make sure everything's clean for the winter. I have a bit of WD-40 on all electrical connectors. And if you've got these types, then just store them together because that's the way that they seal up well. For all the other connectors around the, the boat, I've got a lot of USB connectors to charge things. For instance, a bit of contact cleaner on them first and then a little bit of WD-40 keeps them in good condition. With the drum back from the welders, it's time to get the force day back on. Give everything a polish up, the crank iron here. I uh, want to make sure that not just it looks good, but the, the polish will protect it, remember. So the tang can go on, and with a split pin through the cotter pin here, I, uh, I do bend them all the way back. Some people just uh, open them a little bit, but uh, I do make sure if they're long like this, that I'll trim the ends off so they can't catch on anything. I've cleaned up the thread on the end of the force day here and it's time to, to grease it up. I'm using the dielectric grease on here because uh, it, I think it, it might be stainless steel on stainless steel and I don't want to risk galling. And it's just some silicon grease for where all the bearings go on the drum. A little bit of uh, dry PTFE on the, uh, the nylon parts. So we get everything slid on, top roller and bottom roller, and uh, held up with a halyard. And now I can uh, stretch this down now that I've undone it all the way to just nicely put the cotter pin without too much effort. And now that this bottom joint is turning nicely, I can just uh, get the wrench on and do this up. It goes back up to where I taped the mark, and that should be as it was before. take the rope off and I can slide the drum down and into position. That's got a bearing at the bottom that's all greased up. And then that needs to be bolted onto the foil. Uh, these are those uh, bolts that broke off so I'm, I'm cutting some new ones to length and I've already tapped them out so we can now bolt this all up nice and tight. I've opted for some dielectric grease on the bolts here to try and stop the sort of problem we had last time with the corrosion. So the worry now that the vibration that you always get with foils like this will just work the boats loose. Remember the aluminium's just soft and it can easily happen even with the, uh, the oversized ones I've put in there now. So the way to stop a boat falling out is just to tape them in. This is a, a tip I got from a very experienced rigger uh, and I think it's a good one. Next job then is to line everything up can't stress enough that actually getting this rope run straight is probably the biggest factor in getting this uh, nice and easy to turn and being able to pull in your sow by hand rather than winch it. 
So halyards can come off now and we can go around and tighten up the backstay. Again, just all the way back down to its mark and hopefully everything should be back where it was. Do all the uh, shackles up nice and tight then and a bit of Monel seizing wire that I always put on to make sure things aren't going to fall off when you don't want them to. And then hurrah, time to put the sails back on. Well, almost. I did notice a couple of frayed stitches here as I was pulling the sail back out. So uh, might as well get that done before we get them on. And another handy little device is this one, yeah, especially if you're putting the sails up on your own. It just feeds it into the track quite nicely. I'll put a bit of PTFE spray in there too. And just try and get the sail flaked nicely out onto the bowsprit. And it'll all go up. Sheets on with a couple of bowlins. And she's ready to roll up. Do remember though that rolling her up out at sea with the wind in there should be much tighter and would need some more turns so make sure that you've got some spare turns there on the drum. I'm just going to remake the ends of the sheets and that's all ready to go. If you've seen the brass cleaning video you'll see that I found quite a, a quick way of, uh, of cleaning the brass but I've got a lot of it on this boat and as I said before I do cheat with some of it and I lacquer it. So things like the binnacle here, that was lacquered with a spray lacquer but last year I, uh, I switched over to uh, this which is a brush on lacquer and I did all of these bits, the derades and the bell and as you can see they haven't really come through very well at all. I thought it would be better than the, uh, the spray on but it's not. So I'm going to clean it all off now. That takes uh, a little bit of nitromores and uh, a bit of scrubbing. It's fairly quick to do. Uh, once that's off I'll clean them up and uh, look for another way of um, lacquering them. So engine maintenance, uh, obviously it's not just a yearly thing, it's something that you'll be doing uh, all the time, um, but I've got some time now to, to get on with some of the um, other jobs, regular jobs like oil changes, I've done a separate video on that. Uh, we're probably going to do oil changes now twice a year because of the amount of engine hours we're, we're doing rather than uh, just every year. And I'll look at engine hours for other things like fuel filters, I'm not due those at the moment. The raw water uh, impeller, I'll do every 300 hours, it's only done about 100, that doesn't need doing. Um, obviously I'll check quite often the uh, the fan belt tensions. Fan belt tensions are difficult um, on a boat because it's not like a car where you've got a prescribed length and certainly if you've changed it like this there is there is if you haven't seen it a, um, a video on uh, alternators f fitting a bigger alternator we've got a Baumar alternator on here it's definitely worthwhile having a bigger alternator it's it's one of the stupid things about most boats they put these piddly little uh, alternators on them that um, are supposed to be marine ones that are that are good for for boats and big house banks but they're really not they don't give enough um, amperage and they don't give it for long enough you need an external regulator we've got up here the Balmar has to, to do that job properly so yeah look at look at that video if you're in any doubt of uh, of what you need alternator wise but once you've done that you've got to get the right tension and because you haven't got the, the the lengths of just trying to sort of push and get that quarter of an inch movement in the longest span which is what you'd normally have on a car or something like that a better way really is with a, a torque wrench uh, get a torque wrench on your alternator difficult to do from behind um, and obviously turn it clockwise so you're doing it up now I'm doing it but just I've got this set to 20 newton meters that's 15 foot pounds uh, and it's you can see it's clicking there if if, if I were, were to be able to to move it with that it would be too too loose so you can just do it on friction it's uh, it's probably a more accurate it's, nothing's ideal the torque wrenches aren't massively accurate um, but it's a, it's a more accurate way than just putting your thumb on it and trying to get it there and obviously to get to get proper tension it's no good just uh, putting your something to lever your your alternator over it and heaving it over and locking it off you're, you're never going to get that right there um, much better to have a system like I've got here so you can adjust that properly and get the, the right tension. There were a few comments uh, after I did the alternator uh, video with people saying that they had experienced problems with Baumar where they, um, the, the alternator, and they're very expensive, had died because uh, dust had gone in it, fan belt dust. Uh, and 
I mean, really, they're, it's, it's, they shouldn't be dying with a bit of dust in there. But if they are susceptible to that, that's another reason to, to, to check it. But, you know, really, you should be on top of that anyway. Any sign of any, any dust, any dirt on the front of your, your alternator, there is some slippage going on there uh, and get the tension right. And I think, you know, probably it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fault of the, the way it's fitted in that you couldn't tension it properly or, or check that it's tensioned properly. And that's created that dust. So, you know, you shouldn't be getting that. So it really is, you know, double important I think to have a good way of tensioning and make sure you get the right tension on your belts all the time. You can see from the system here as well that I've got the, the double uh, V belts on here. Uh, would probably have been better to have serpentine in but that would have made me changing all the, all the pulleys on here. Um, if I'd had the choice I think I would have done that but, but given that I've got doubles uh, I had to find then a way to, to have the water pump uh, being driven as well from the uh, crankshaft pulley. So I've got a three uh, grooved V-belt on the crankshaft there and just one of those comes up. You don't really want to have a lot of tension on this belt because you'll end up stressing the bearings in the water pump and going through those quite quickly. Uh, and this system's very good here the way I've, I've got that because I've got a long wrap and it's, it's a 180 degree wrap there. Uh, whereas normally, you know, you've, you've, you'd only have maybe 90, 100 degrees of wrap. So I don't need uh, as much tension on that. You can see it's not, it's not that much tension there at all. And obviously the water pump itself doesn't take much force to turn. So, so really uh, you don't have to go mad with that. So it's a very good way actually, I think to have that separate. So I'm happy with that. So not much for me to do on the engine this year. I have already changed the uh, exhaust oil, but I, I showed it in the back and fill video that I did previously, I think. Uh, one final thing, um, I do have a problem with the doors when I'm uh, when we're at sea working on it and the doors just flap around. So to stop that, I've just put these gas struts on, which hopefully should stop that. They uh, seem to be quite good. They'll hold the door quite firmly open and then you can just quite easily push them and lock them shut. So let's we'll see how well that works. OK, I can feel this video getting very long now, so I'll make this the last thing. I'm just going to go around all the hatches. If you've got hatches that have got these turning uh, locks like that, they'll have little O-rings inside and they always perish. And then you'll get these little drips that just come down. Really annoying. This one would be really annoying because it's over our bed. So I'll just go around them all and you'll find you've got this little ring here. You can buy them in packs just like this, so you don't have to go and try and source the ones for the hatch itself, which would be expensive and difficult to get, I imagine. So a little bit of Vaseline on there, slip the o-ring on and uh, push it through and then we can screw it all back up. Well, if you made it to the end of this, uh, well done. I uh, hope you got something uh, useful out of it. Uh, do try and uh, keep up with the episodes of Sailing Fair Isle. Thanks for watching.